Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is John Pham. John is an entrepreneur, team builder, former aerospace engineer, and practicing orthodontist. As CEO and co-founder of Inbrace, John and his team are building an entire new category of teeth straightening, giving the 500 million people who've opted out of orthodontics a solution that has clinical precision and doesn't require work of lifestyle adjustments while in treatment. It delivers a completely hidden solution with smart wire being placed behind your teeth to gently perfect your smile in half the time with half the pain and half the work. Prior to Embrace, John spent years as a Boeing engineer and startup entrepreneur, then went on to USC and graduated with a master's degree in craniofacial biology and completed a residency at USC. He also received his bachelor's degree in engineering and doctorate degree in dental surgery from UCLA. John now serves as a managing orthodontist for Bristol Dental and Orthodontics, as well as co-principal investigator at USC's Advanced Orthodontics and Vitterbee Engineering Group. He has been recognized in 2018, 2019, and 2020 when Inbrace was one of the Orange County's top workplaces, and in 2019 and 20 when he was named Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year finalist. He currently resides in Orange County with his wife and two children. Welcome, John. Hi, Shauna. Pleasure to be here. Okay, we're going to start with the interview. Um, I'm so excited, like beyond, with a rapid fire. You ready? All right, let's do it. Okay, given your business, I'm super curious. This is on the spot, but who's the best celebrity smile out there? Oh, there's so many HIPAA things I can't. <laughs> Besides you, you've got a good smile. Look at those teeth. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Because of the HIPAA things, um, you know, um, unless people are giving me permission or unless people have posted it on, you know, um, social media, I can't really mention. But I'll say we we do have wives of basketball players. We have Hollywood stars. We have politicians. You know, I mean, this is really, you know, treatment for folks who want to get teeth straightening but don't want people to know they're getting teeth straightening. Yeah. So Tell me about you. Tell me three words that would describe your leadership style. I, uh, you know, I'm a big basketball guy. So if I were to pick, I would say I have the um, ruthlessness of Michael Jordan with the teamwork of Magic Johnson. Um, I'm, I'm relentless, I'm empowering, and I'm scrappy. Love it. And I, think I that, love the scrappy. Scrappy is a perfect basketball word. <laughs> that, that, that probably comes from, you know, growing up, you know, first generation immigrant, right? Yeah. Parents are refugees, yeah. come and run a rickety boat, right? Yeah, um, I can't wait I, to get into that story. Okay, so if you could have any superpower, what would it be? These are good. <laughs> um, entrepreneurs either live in the present, uh, in, in the future, or in the past, and I think you call it superpower or not, just knowing how to be present, and enjoying what you have today. Because it is about oh the my gosh, that might be I've asked that question several times. That might be my best answer I've gotten. The idea of being present is so aspirational for many of us, right? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, really, like I've, I thought about this one, you know, too, like what's superpower? Because, you know, I mean, you, you get asked this and you ask this a lot, too. And yeah, you know, flying and healing the world and, you know, um, have my superpower being having as many superpowers as I want. But <laughs> that's I think, so smart. Like I've, the genie in the bottle more. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, I think really like, you know, now that I'm getting to this point in my life, um, it, it really is. We always talk about, about, about enjoying the journey. Yeah. It's learning how to be present. Yeah. You know? um, um, are you an introvert or an extrovert? I think I lean more on being an extrovert. Um, I, I would I'm, guess I'm, that. <laughs> but, but, but I'm learning how to be, how to appreciate the introverted side of things too. Yeah. Which, well, which the, pan to, the pandemic, like probably... <laughs> It had an impact on that. The I'm pandemic guessing. definitely did. But this also goes to the, the part of being present. And we can talk about this later if you want, but I'm learning the art of meditation and, and, oh, yeah. and, wow. uh, and uh, what it brings. I definitely want to learn from you. Okay. So if you had an extra hour in the day, how would you spend it? Maybe meditating. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. If I, uh, well, again, I'm a, you know, we, we can talk more. I mean, the title of this is what, what fuels you, right? Um, and a lot of folks listening here will probably all workaholics, but um, that 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 hour is being present, whatever it is that I'm doing, you know, with my family, in my work, um, or by myself. 
Yeah. That really is what I would yeah. do. Well, if you could have dinner with anyone in the world, I guess maybe living or someone who's passed away, who would you choose? I've always really wanted to meet Thomas Jefferson. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, you know, I, he, he was a Renaissance man. He was an engineer too. Um, and I'm an engineer by training. So, you know, he had the vision to start um, uh, West Point um and and you know push science and you know uh, math and all those things and um yeah I, I thought he did a lot of amazing things okay so this is my final rapid fire and then i'm super excited to get into your life um okay so if there was a book written about your life what would it be called you do you nice i like that I, title I, I that's think awesome i think it says you do you i think um a lot of us go through school um, watch commercials, um, read books <laughs> that all try to tell us who we should be and how we should act. And I think really in this world, it's about doing you and finding out what fuels you, what defines you. Um, and in doing so, we can talk about this too, is, you know, you would create your own category and not fit inside someone else's category or box. Right. Yeah, um, I love it. I would read that book. I'm reading that book for sure. And Shauna, I had to become an engineer and then a dentist and then an orthodontist <laughs> just so I could figure out that I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I love it. Well, they're all blending together to make the perfect product that we're going to talk about. It sure. makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So tell us, you you grew up in Los Angeles, son of immigrant farmers. Um, tell me, tell our listeners all about your origin story. It's so inspiring. You know, I mean, it it, it is the immigrant story. Um, that um, I believe everybody here is an immigrant, um, especially, you know, in the U.S. And my parents came from, you know, war-stricken Vietnam, fleeing communism and oppression on rickety boats. And when they got here, all they had were these, you know, seeds in their pockets, right? Um, and uh, we settled on the east side of L.A., um, where we didn't know any better, you know, wherever there was free soil, we just plant. I call it ghetto farming, you know. And um, when you're driving through uh, LA, you always see, you know, these kids on the side of the freeway selling oranges. I mean, that, that was me growing up, except that instead of oranges, I sold vegetables. I sold Asian herbs. Wow. Um, and, you know, you, you, you learn a lot of things, you know, going through that. You learn about what a commodity is. <laughs> you learn about, um, how to sell something different. Yeah, I was about to say how to sell. Were you, did you ever, this is like completely off topic or maybe not, but I'm super curious when you said herbs, did your mom like use herbs from a healing perspective also? Um, yeah, um, uh, you know, uh, Eastern medicine, I think goes, I mean, I'm saying here as a clinically, you know, uh, medically trained, you know, person here um, in the States, but, um, yeah, I mean, Eastern medicine dates back thousands and thousands. I of know. Years. So, so I yeah, know. I mean, you, 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 you learn the benefit of whole holistic medicine. Right. Um, but you know, we, we, we planted like bok choy and Asian basil and mints and, you know, all these things. And that's what we sold. I mean, I vividly remember going to the nine nines, uh, ranch market, which is a, you know, big Asian market here in Southern California. And we'd, we'd show up at 8 o'clock and sell our boxes full of vegetables. And then at 8 p.m. at night, we'd come back to the same store and go around the back and jump in the dumpster to dig out these boxes and save 10 cents. I, I read about that and I loved that story. And I was thinking that actually probably has influenced somewhat, maybe consciously or subconsciously, like how you lead a company, how you manage, how you, you know, manage the P&L. Just yeah, all of you, it. Like, you, where can we, where can we cut? Yeah, there's, there, there, there's a lot we can go with all these things, but yeah, I, I learned a lot. I, I, I learned, um, there are times to work on the business and not in the business. I mean, there we were working in the business trying to save for sure. Sense. But, but they were, they were in wartime at the time, mm -hmm. you know, like, like we, you know, my parents were trying to do whatever we can to submit the bill. So we had to do that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so was, were your parents clear on, or was it just through modeling behavior on your kind of core values that were important to them? Um, there were certain things that were, you know, um, always reinforced, right, um, in, our, in our family. Uh, I mean, you know, my parents are Catholic, so, you know, we, we always 
talked about giving back and making sure that we saw value in everyone. And um, um, as I fast forward in the story, we eventually um, saved up enough money to buy our own piece of land. Wow. And um, our home became sort of a halfway home for other refugees coming from other war stricken countries. So I grew up with Cambodians, Laotians, you know, Latinos, all types of folks, right? Uh, working side by side with them, you know, in the farm. And um, yeah, you, you, you learn that no matter who you are, you have a way to contribute, right? Um, I learned that um, no matter if it's raining or it's sunshine or hail or whatever it is, you, you still farm. You still do what you can. Mm-hmm. I think that's, that, so that's the, the work entre- ethic part. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the entrepreneurial spirit, right? Yeah. Um, and the, the last thing is that I also learned that I hated farming. <laughs> so, um, and we can talk about this now or later, but the first thing I did when I got to college was I actually dropped out. Yeah. First yeah. I, I read about that and that you told your mom, you were like, don't worry if it doesn't work out like with the startup that you're going to go back. Yeah. So, and so, pursue so medicine, I love it. So, um, uh, if you, if you want to talk about that, yeah. now, you know, uh, well, but- well, I do want to ask you a couple more things. Cause I'm always yeah. super curious about parents and teachers and kind of how they influenced you. And I'm just curious, was there a, a person or a moment where you had a realization that you would go on to do bigger things? Like, did somebody plant that in your mind or was that just like, that's Shauna, that's just me. No. That's who I am. Yeah. My grandma, um, She's 94 years old now. She survived through World War II, the Korean War, you know, refugee, um, you know, all these things. She defied the odds, you know, all the whole way through. So she, she did instill in me sort of um, this notion of, you know, don't let people tell you how things should be. You define how things should be, right? I love um, that. She's such a winner. I mean, she's so stubborn. She still walks herself to church every day, you know. Um, uh, I mean, she had a broken foot once, and the, and you know, the doctor showed her this X ray. She's like, I don't know what the hell this is. I survived the war. I'm gonna walk. I walk myself to church if I wanted to. <laughs> I she, love her. She she's walked my to church on a, on a broken toe. Yeah. I love that old school. So, is, were you a good student? I'm guessing. I mean, gosh. you know, I, 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 it was one of those things where. I think when I cared enough, I was, you know, but, but I didn't grow up wanting to be a doctor. I, I, I didn't, you know, know if I was ever quite frankly smart enough. So my, my, my grades were just kind of average going through school, you know. But you were the first in your family to go to college, right? I was the first in my family to go to college, yeah. Wow. And you're, where are you in the sibling thing? You have one sibling? Um, I'm the oldest. Of yeah. two? The oldest of three. I'm the oldest of three, so I got two younger siblings. Yeah, and did they go on also, kind of following your footsteps? So it's, it's kind of funny, right? My parents, I always love that you're like set the t- set the bar high. Yeah. The uh, so yeah, my my, my parents um, always wanted us to be in healthcare, so all of us fled healthcare, mm-hmm. but we all ended up somehow becoming in healthcare. So my 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 sister uh, became a psychology major, but eventually became a nurse, um, and my my brother did something else, and he eventually you know, became a physician. Yeah, found his uh, way back. So tell yeah, me about like, yeah. so dropping out of, you went to UCLA for undergrad? Yes, I did. And you, I mean, that's an incredibly difficult school to get into. So you must've done something right with your grades. I love your, I think you're being Oh humbled. no, actually I was denied. I had to appeal. <laughs> well, still, I'm sorry. That's a really, an engineering oh. school. Like that's incredible. Oh. So what well, made you drop out? How well, I mean, it, 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 it is one of those things where I, I didn't want to take no for an answer. So, yeah. um, so I was, I was supposed to go to Berkeley actually. Oh, another um, ridiculously impossible school to get into. Yeah. Um, I was supposed to go to Berkeley. And then when UCLA said, no, I said, no, you're not going to say no to me. So I actually applied. Uh, I became a late, you know, late admit, you know, whatever yeah. they call it. Um, um, and, and yeah, uh, you know. And so how come you, how come you dropped out of um, school? What were you pursuing at the time? So during, during that time, it was the tech boom. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I, after all those years of farming, I just wanted to make some money. And so uh, I dropped out. I joined um, a internet startup with a few other friends, and I'm sure your family loved that. Oh yeah, well, my mom almost <laughs> my mom almost killed me for it, but I I kind of told her I said, hey, you know, if you let me drop out, I'll be the Asian son you always wanted. Yeah, <laughs> she said, okay, fine, if you know, if you promise me that. So she kind of lets me drop out, and um, we we joined this tech startup uh, doing. We we had this notion that if you 
This is in the 90s, right? Yeah, no, I get it. I was there right there with you. Yeah, we, we had this notion that if you created an online environment that allowed vendors to go on there and advertise their product, that maybe consumers would click on a button, buy it online, and it would show up at their house. Um, can you imagine that? But, yeah, I know. Can you imagine that? So people call it online shopping now. Um, there's a company that the guy named Jeff Bezos started that kind yeah. of, I think, did okay with that. But Kind of a disruptor, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but, but you know, uh, Shauna, I, I will tell you, at a young age, though, um, we, we, we did okay. I mean, you know, we were 19, 20-year-olds driving Ferraris and Lamborghinis. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, uh, the best thing that happened to me during that time was the tech crash. Yeah, um, because you also learn that these things that you own don't own you, and the things that you thought define success really don't define success. Was right. there what was the kind of um, did it, did the company fail or what happened? Um, I mean, it was the prototypical tech bubble. Yeah, right. Um, and I so- had so many companies. I was recruiting in, in those days, and um, I had so many companies that were like the hot company, and then like six months later, they're out of business. I mean, tons yeah. of them. Um, so yeah, I mean that those statistics are real, but like the one percent or something. Well, but, I, I think that that goes back to what farming kind of taught me, though, right? It's like there's going to be times of feast and famine. There's going to be times of drought and you know rain, and you got to sort of weather through it. And sometimes you change the crops. So mm, you know, I, I was that. going, I was going down that that tech route, um, but it was time to change the crops. So you know, I mean, the, the, you yeah. Know, the, 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 you know, who you are doesn't change. You're supposed to get better from it. So I just went back to school, finished my degree and, you know, took what I learned from there and moved on. Okay. So you go back to UCLA and mm-hmm. then ultimately pursue um, orthodontics. Like how did oh, you end so, up? Yeah. Tell me about so, that. So actually I, I, I end up pursuing, um, finishing my degree in my degree in engineering. Yeah. And, and um, I ended up working at the Boeing company. Right. Oh yeah, I have that. I have missed that whole part of your life. That's a that's a huge yeah. part of your life. So, engineering, so, yeah, yeah. So I mean, all this, I I kind of want to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about these these twists and turns, right? Um, because, I mean, Steve Jobs says it best: like these things only make sense when you connect the dots going backwards. They don't make sense mm. the dots going forward. And, and <laughs> you, you got to get us trust that things will pan out. You have to, right? Um, I, I think a, a lot of younger generation right now, you, you, you were kind of programmed to like, you got to decide on this major and then yeah. when you graduate, you can do this thing. And then it's, it's, it's going to, you know, ruin your life forever. You pick the wrong thing. And it's totally, totally untrue. <laughs> totally untrue. Totally. You know, these are just boxes people put you in saying you got to do this thing and just follow your dream, follow your passion. And, you know, at the time I wanted to do a tech startup, right? Because, because, you know, I just wanted to see what this, but the power of venture capital and, 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 and ideas like, you know, where it can take you, how quickly. And I saw it, you know, it was yeah. crazy. Um, there's one thing, you know, I would say that, that I learned during that, that tech boom thing, though, is what success, power, and money can do to people. And I think that was when I learned one of my first life lessons is um, people will kill for money but people would die for recognition. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if that makes sense to you, you know, what I'm saying here. Um, I mean, you know, people will die for recognition and ego is the enemy. And if you don't control yourself, you know, and, and, and you don't really find out what, what success really is for you, you can get caught up in this recognition, fame, power. Yeah, all like, the ego cycle. stuff. Yeah, um, especially in these days of social media, that's another conversation. I, I do think social media is a 21st century cigarette. You know? Yes, I, I totally agree. I mean, I totally agree. Yeah. But um, anyway, you know, moving moving forward here, um, you know, do, doing doing my first startup, you learn what, again, you know, venture capital ideas can do. And I, I you know, Shauna, like you, you, you work a lot with folks here, you know, that very successful. And I think going back to being present, I mean, entrepreneurs, you always want to strive for the next thing, you know, and, and we do live in the present or the past and we don't spend that much time living in the present yeah um so that, that that's a lesson i'm trying to practice right now 
I think it's incredible that, you know, it's just even being in that growth mindset to know that you have areas and blind spots um, is everything. And I have to say, I do meet a lot of um, incredible people. There are people who you can tell are leading with their ego and are focused on um, recognition and money and power. But generally speaking, I feel like if you can just get down to the core and you're just really authentic off the bat, like that's just who you are. You kind of lead with your heart. At least that's my impression of you. Not everybody's like that. But I think if you if, if you can peel back the layers and really get to, most people just want the same thing. They want connection. They want uh, purpose. See, you know, see, I mean, that's the fine balance, right? Is the truth is we have everything that we'd ever want. And mm -hmm. it's free. Yeah. Right? Oh, and, yeah. Tell me what's on your tell me what's on your wall behind you. Yes, I, I, here, I can lift my camera here. So I, I just five things to remind myself that cost zero money or talent to 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 be successful one is be on time two is have an open mind three is have a good attitude four is be prepared and five is learn from others oh my gosh I love you have to take a photo of that and send it to me okay I, I'd be happy to. so tell me tell me about your work at Boeing like I, I that's a whole part of your life that I mean Boeing obviously I'm in Seattle yeah yeah <laughs> I, I made many trips to to uh, Seattle because of Boeing but so again, you know, in tech startups, you you learn a lot about what you know the power of sort of you know um, ideas and, and and capital can do, right? And you can move things pretty quickly. At Boeing, it's just people and hope, you know, and 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 the the the, the belief that man can do something amazing, you know. Um, I mean, we put people on the moon, you know, we're putting satellites out there. We're, yeah. we're, 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 as John F. John F. Kennedy said, we're, we're designing stuff that doesn't exist, made it up, made out of materials we haven't invented yet. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, um, it was, it was, it was amazing there. I, I worked on, um, um, some top secret projects. I can maybe say it now because it's been long enough, but I've worked on, um, Air Force One. Um, oh, wow. Uh, uh, yeah. Components of, you know, Air Force One. Uh, and interestingly, um, fast forward 10 years later, my boss's 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 boss at Boeing, which is the, the CTO, the head of all engineers at Boeing, ended up being an Embrace patient and is now, oh my on our, gosh. now on our advisory board here at Embrace. How cool yeah, is that? And, and I, I was totally geeking out. Okay, totally oh, geeking sure. out. You know, but, but, you know, I, I kind of talked to him. I said, hey, you know, his name is John as well. It's John J. Tracy. I said, hey, John, if... If you can build rockets, man, we can we can find a way to string teeth better, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's uh, so cool. Yeah, so, so how long were you at Boeing? So I was at Boeing for um, I don't know, three three ish you know uh, years. Um, yeah. And on my you know second year there, Mama taps me on the shoulder one day and she says, "Hey, you you know you know you promised me." <laughs> And I, I said, I said, what was that? She said, you know, you, you promised me if I let you drop out that you would be, you know, you would go to uh, uh, become a doctor. So I said, okay. Um, so, you know, med school, you know, I don't think it was really for me. I didn't want to put in that many years. And I, I knew yeah. dentistry. Dentistry um, is something that impacts all of us. And at the time, I think wasn't very, didn't have very much innovation there yet. So uh, I applied to dental school. Luckily, I got into UCLA. Uh, this time, amazing. this time I got in. My this time you didn't time, have to appeal. Yeah. First time I applied. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, going through dental school, decided to apply to orthodontic school. And in in the back of my mind, I was always, you know, once you do entrepreneurship, it never leaves you. Of course. So so I was just I just kept my eyes open. I said, okay, there's got to be something here. And when I got to ortho schools, when I met my co-founder, Dr. Hong Sheng Tong who's yeah. um, a, a top orthodontist, world-renowned bone biologist um, coming out of China. And I'll tell you, when you're a top bone biologist in the U.S., that's one of 200, 300 million people. When you're you know, top coming out of China, that's like two, three billion people. I that's mean, this incredible. Guy, this guy's legit. So you, how'd you meet him? <laughs> uh, he interviewed me in ortho school. So literally, I come into my interview, I meet him, and then we start talking about how we're going to change the industry. Yeah. And yeah. how did, so this was an idea, was this, like, tell me about the idea of so, Embrace. Yeah, I, so um, when when we met, it wasn't like, I have this idea, let's pursue it. It was like, hey, you know what? You think different, I think different. You know, let, let's, let's, let's work together. And wow. um, our first year or two in residency at USC, um, I, I went to research. And 
we published a ton of papers and um, made the cover of the American Journal a couple of times. And these things that we discovered or we found, found it just kind of stayed in the journals. They didn't really get, have impact at the chair side. And, and that's, that's when we told each other, hey, you know what, to have impact at the chair side, you have to have, you know, um, you have to productize it. You know, mm -hmm. you, you, you have to find something, you know, to get all these innovations in. I mean, to make a long story short, we, 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 we made discoveries in how to move teeth using more gentle forces. We've made discoveries in how to use computer technology to move teeth more um, precisely. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we found out ways to do it behind the teeth so uh, it's less visible. Mm -hmm. uh, the behind but, the teeth part, I mean, the vanity part, whenever I think of Embrace, that's the part that stands out to me as like, the thing yeah. um, i'm sure all those other things are obviously important and more technical from like behind the scenes but i'm like oh my gosh imagine and now i start seeing people and i'm like i never would have thought they needed them but now i'm like if you could just get them behind your teeth yeah right? so, so this was actually the interesting part right um if, if i can you know talk about this is the origins of all this was when i was making my rotations to um, children's hospital los angeles um, we were working with kids with cleft lip and palate uh, mm. i don't know if you yeah, familiar with what that is. Yes. So these are kids with the most disfigured, you know, jaws and mouths, and um, they usually come from more um, lower income families, mm -hmm. and they would have to drive hours, you know, um, sometimes three, four hours every single month for years on end, for like four or five years even, to get orthotic treatment, right, to, to fix these jaws. And, and you, you know, we thought maybe there's a way to use some of our research to make it so that these kids don't have to come in every single month mm -hmm. right, for tightenings. Maybe we can do it in a way where it's not so painful for them, doesn't require as much sort of uh, tightening by the orthodontist or, or by the surgeon. And, 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 you know, lastly, maybe we can do it in a way where they don't have, they don't have to look worse before they, before they, they look better. And we found that, you know what? These needs that I listed out applies not only to kids with cleft lip and palate. It applies to people like you and me. Everybody, yeah. Our audience. My youngest patient, my youngest embrace patient is eight years old. My oldest embrace patient is 80 years old. And so that was sort of the early genesis of embrace. Yeah. And so, so you have this idea, right? And then you're thinking, okay, now we have to productize it. We have to fund it. Mm -hmm. We have to name it. Yes. Yes. How did all those things like walk me through? I always love that part. Like, are you sitting in a room and you guys are like, okay, let's just think of the name and how, who are we going to call? And it's yeah. such a, it's such an not, maybe it's not off the radar as an industry, but in my mind, it's not necessarily the VC on the radar, uh, you know, field. They're not thinking about orthodontics. Well, there's, there's always, you know, if I can kind of shoot it straight, there's these sexy innovations that everyone wants mm -hmm. to money into, you know, like, you know, well, consumer, your consumer products, like, yeah, of course, 3D Airbnb, Airbnb, yeah, type Airbnb thing. Yeah. and self-driving cars and, you know, yeah. all those things. And, you know, um, at the time, I'll tell you, it's, it was hard to get funding for teeth straining, right? Right. I'm like thinking who's. Yeah. So, so we, we, we couldn't get VC funding. So I had to apply, we had to apply to these business competitions. Mm. Where, like literally you would go out there and you, you, you'd have half an hour to pitch. And you'd pitch. Yeah. I've been, I've been a judge at a few of those things. Those are fun. So, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we pitched it our first one and it was a check of $50,000. And I remember I had to like rehearse looking in the mirror saying, we need $50,000. And if we got it, we would change the world, <laughs> right? Uh, and we competed against 3D printing, you know, cancer therapeutics and all. And we ended up winning, right? That's amazing. And, and the next competition was $100,000. And the next competition was $150,000. And then $200,000. And then that check became $20 million, And that check became $45 million, And Okay. Whoa, well, whoa. Well, this is incredible. Yeah. I love it. I mean, so you, you, you go from business competitions to angel funding to VC and then investment bankers. And the story just became bigger. The checks became bigger. And there's one thing that I will tell you, Shauna, is that um, time and time again, People would come up to me. I'd ask them, like, "Why? Why this? You know, um, you know, over there you got cancer therapeutics. Why not fund that?" And everyone told me, like, you know, embrace. It may not save lives, but it definitely changes lives, and it impacts all of us that are in this room that are listening to this podcast. And it's definitely yeah. that 
all of us would use if there was a different option. And, yeah. And, and this goes into, again, you know, when I talk about building your own category and challenging the status quo, I think there are so many things in this world that we've just come to accept what it is because society told us it is. And it takes entrepreneurs or people who are willing to question and ask why to say, well, does it really have to be that way? Do taxis really have to be stinky and exactly all and on call? And yeah, would people actually give up their home and let somebody sleep in their bed? Like, yeah. ew, like that seems crazy yeah. at the time. And this is a whole another thing that I'm very passionate about too. It's it's um, I think people who create their own boxes or create their own categories, they understand like it, it's not just just about making something better, faster, cheaper. Sometimes the world just wants something different and, mm -hmm. and you need someone that's willing to be different and embrace themselves. Yeah. Well, yours also is better. It's not just different. It's better. Like, can you imagine how many people that, I mean, I'm just thinking like when you're going to raise money, it's not just that it's a great story that it helps people. It's also like, think about the total addressable market. Yeah. It's like, oh. hi, everyone, yeah, well, all humans. So I, I think that's, that's the thing, right? So again, um, if I can go into some stats here, yeah, I want three out of every four people need some kind of tooth movement. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. So in the U.S., you know, if you account for so I said there's like a 300 million plus you know population. If you account for household incomes over 75,000, that still amounts to about 185 million people who could afford teeth straightening, who need teeth straightening, but are not spending money on teeth straightening. Right. They are spending money on Botox, LASIK, hydrafacial beauty health products, you know, lipstick, you know, teeth whitening. Right? Teeth are the most essential of all of that. Yeah. Well, like someone's got a beautiful face, but the, the like jacked up teeth. No offense well, I, to mean, I, I mean, that can, that can be argued. And what I would say is people who care about their skin, people who care about their lips, care about their teeth. Yes. And I mean, I'm, you know, if I can just do a little plug here. Did you know, Shauna, that um, if you have straighter teeth, your teeth look whiter? Because you know the light reflects better on your teeth. Yeah. Did you know that if you had straighter teeth, your lips look fuller? All right, fuller. So. Well, and you also look. You're also more likely to smile, which gives off positive energy, which yeah. I mean gives every kind of result under the sun. So that's definitely true too. And um, the point I'm making with that sort of note is that people who think about getting Botox and fillers are prime candidates for embrace because mm -hmm. again your, your lips look fuller people who get teeth whitening are prime candidates for embrace because your teeth look whiter people who yeah. want to look younger are prime candidates. so these are things that people just don't know because yeah. the general public thinks of orthotic care teeth straightening as mouthful of metal yes and nobody wants that at a certain age my dad got braces when he was like 40 and i remember it was like a very big deal or or, and, or like yeah or, or like these nasty trays you gotta take in and out and Getting, I mean, if you think about adults, which is the untapped market, right? If, if, if you, for some reason, missed out on getting teeth straightening when you were young, right? Um, the last thing you want to do as a new grad and you have a job, you know, maybe at a top accounting firm or something, and they give you this big deal, you don't want to walk in as a youngest guy there with a mouthful of metal. Exactly. So, so, you know, a lot of us sort of young professionals or, you know, working professionals miss out on these things. And, you know, I wanted to create a product that can that can help expand the market. And that's what we're doing now. So, you know. So, so how much have you raised to date? I mean, you started talking about millions and then more millions and crazy. So we, we've, we, we've raised about, you know, $75 million to date. Um, wow. Uh, and what, what's the business model, John? Like how, who are you selling into? Yeah. So. Uh, this is, you know, uh, very much a B to B to C product, right? Um, I believe wholeheartedly that um, orthotic care is best done by a professional. And I think mm -hmm. the people who have not opted in still want treatment done by a professional. Um, but at the same time, it's a product that, you know, it's, it's not being pushed by just, you know, six, 7,000 orthodontists in the U.S. Hundreds of millions of consumers are asking for this by name. No. Yeah. So if someone's listening to this podcast and they're like, oh, wait, oh my gosh, this is perfect for me. What's the process? They go and ask their orthodontist or they find an orthodontist. How do they find who does embrace and how do those people get trained? Yeah. So we, we have um, providers um, scattered in uh, geographies all across the nation. And uh, the best way to get started now is to go on uh, embrace.com, look up, find a provider. And uh, these providers are trained you know, by us and they're some of the top mm -hmm. orthodontists in the nation. Wow. And how does the cost compare to like the braces I had as a little girl twice, by yep. the way? 
So, you know, um, uh, we've been able to offer Embrace at the same price point as plastic aligners and wow. braces. So, which is, you know, usually about four to $6,000 um, uh, before insurance. Now with insurance, it goes down, you know, even more. Um, and everybody's um, malocclusion or teeth and mouth are different. So it's best to come in and have a uh, Embrace provider um, check you out. But what's what's important is if you if you take a look online, you'll see that behind the teeth treatment has been done before, but it hasn't ever been mainstream because you know they just took braces on the outside and put it on the inside. So they took something that was painful, required a lot of adjustments, you know, um, put it on the inside and made it even even worse, <laughs> right? So um, uh, behind the teeth treatment generally costs about twelve thousand dollars. That's with the old technology. And as an engineer, I'm proud to say that we've created a new smart wire category to enable this to now be at four to $6,000, right? Wow. Within, within, within reach for most consumers in a way that's more gentle, more sort of um, lifestyle convenient, right? Less invasive into your daily life. Wow, that's amazing. And so what's the biggest challenge right now? Is it... Um... You know, you've got the funding, so you're scaling quickly. Um, two things on that. But my, my first thing is like, is one of the challenges adoption from the orthodontic community? Mm. Like, or, and do they feel like this is cannibalizing what they've already built? Or, how, or is this another offering? Like, how does that work? Yeah, you know, that's, you know, first of all, I'll say orthodontists have been um, um, embracing embrace. No, no pun intended. Right? <laughs> embracing uh, embrace. Okay. Embracing yeah. embrace. <laughs> Um, and I think that's because um, some of these other treatment therapies are commoditizing the profession, right? And um, I think, do you wear contacts or lace? I need to. Can you tell I'm like squinting? I so, want to. So you wear, no. so you have readers. I, I think I, you, I wear readers here and there when I remember to put them on. Yes. So look, this is important for the listeners out there, the entrepreneurs out there. Um, it's not an either or game. You can have both and, and I'll explain, okay? For vision, some people like readers, like what you're wearing, right? It's the most old school. Um, it's the most sort of obvious that you're wearing it, uh, but some people like how it looks and it's fine, okay? Some folks like contact lenses. You pop them in and out. It requires you to reach into your eyes all day long and you get it through the mail without ever seeing an, a doctor and that, that's fine. Um, um, some folks want LASIK, and, and, and that requires you to come in to a brick and mortar, get treated by a specialist, but that requires no effort on your side when it's done, uh, once it's done, and it's the most sort of invisible of all. And I think similar, you know, similarly with teeth straightening, some people are going to get braces, some people are going to get contact lenses, and some people are going to get LASIK. And that's what embraces mm. is the LASIK of teeth straightening, right? Now, ah. now is there going to be cannibalization? There's going to be some. There's going to be some people that, you know, have glasses, didn't want contacts, but would jump to. You but know, I mean, not more like if an orthodontist is already doing it, he's gotten a great reputation for the way he does things. This is just additive for his practice, well, right? So that's, that's the part that I wanted to lean into is what we're finding is that we're actually growing the market. Yeah. I exactly. mean, this is just like, oh my gosh, look at all these new clients exactly. I can get. There's, People there's, who might not have otherwise even gotten to. Exactly. Yeah. There's a huge, you know, I mean, data showing there's, there's an incremental sort of component to Embrace that's growing the market. There's a lot of our, our, our Embrace uh, customers are telling us, I never would have gotten this if it wasn't for your product, right? And, and you know, if, if you've ever re read the book, Blue Ocean Strategy, which, which I firmly believe in, or, or the book, you know, Play Bigger, I think real category creators you know, they, they don't just cannibalize, they grow the market the way mm. Airbnb did, the way Tesla did with electric powered cars, right? Totally. Um, I, I don't know if you can name name a couple. I mean, you talk to entrepreneurs all the time, but there are certain types of products. I, actually, the iPhone, <laughs> you know. Uh, there's, there's a ton of them. Yeah. No, they're amazing. So you're, you're in this situation. You started in this business. You, you know, you start out, you're writing research papers, you're getting published. Then you go on to, to find this company all the way up through series D funding. Now you've got over a hundred employees, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. We, we, we have about 200 employees now and oh, you know. 200. Wow. So you're in this like crazy scaling, fast growth. And I know from you that culture and people 
are at the forefront of kind of um, what matters most to you. How do you plan on maintaining a strong culture while also growing so quickly? I'd love to talk about this because um, it is very dear to my heart here. Um, and it is, if you read the book, Blitz Scaling, we did go from a small sort of family of three or four people to start this company off to like a tribe of 10, you know, 20 people to, you know, a village, right, of, you know, several hundred. And we're going to be like a, a city of several thousand soon. And I mean, I'm sure you have these stories early on. Everyone knows each other's names. Everybody mm -hmm. knows quirks. You know what the guy's going to order for lunch, right? Totally. And, and now it's like you kind of know everybody's name, but not really. Um, I think as an entrepreneur, as you scale, you have to know what's important and hold dear to those things. And at this point, it's maybe two, three things, you know, um, and and um, the rest, you have to just trust the tribe or the village will self-manage itself. So as you're thinking about scaling, are there things that you're kind of holding holding on to as far as your leadership style to mm -hmm. just know that it, whether you know the person's name or not, they know you. Yeah. And so what do you want them to know that you stand for? What's important for people to know what we stand for here at Embrace is that um, we do what we say we're going to do. You know, we are transparent in, in how we go to market. We don't believe in, this is a whole other comment. We don't believe in market manipulation. We don't believe in, you know, um, in med device. It's very rampant with tiered pricing and all those things. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not going to mess with the market with that. Like if you believe in this product, you're going to use it, just like how Apple goes to market, right? Um, and, and that, you know, our, our, our job here is to double the amount of people getting teeth straining because we think the market's underserved and we're going to double the amount of people getting teeth training and we're going to bring it from you know the six million people right now that getting you know orthotic treatment in the u.s to 12 million and 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 wow. beyond wow yeah. that's awesome and so as far as expansion are you planning on expansion um from a geographic standpoint like maybe going international or are you planning on extending um your product offerings to you know offer more products Shana, people around the world want to smile and they want to be proud of their smile. So, uh, I mean, definitely this is a product that touches everybody worldwide, um, but we're going to focus um, right now primarily uh, in the U.S. Um, domestically. Uh, and, um, you know, we'll be raising uh, funds soon to uh, raise. Wow. A yeah. Wow. More. That's amazing. Incredible. And so how has this past year during the pandemic been? I mean, obviously, it's a weird time for somebody to uh, nobody wants their mouth touched. <laughs> nobody was in doctor's offices getting, uh, you know, cosmetic things done. Um, how was it? And how did you handle it as a leader? I think definitely when COVID first started, it, everybody took a pause, right, to question how and why we do things the way we do. But I will say, fast forward a year later, um, we're coming out stronger than ever. And one of my mentors told me, you know, while COVID was terrible, right, um, and, and um, a lot of bad things happened, it didn't stop many things. In fact, for entrepreneurs, it accelerated many things. Mm -hmm. And if you were somebody that thought the sky was falling and, you know, you, you don't adapt, it just accelerated that. But if you were the type of person that, like, that knew how to pivot, that, that knew how to you know, evolve and change and accelerate that, right? Um, totally. And, and, you know, with, with, with COVID, um, I think, you know, a lot of people um, were staring at themselves through Zoom like we are right now, um, seeing their smiles and noticing that this isn't, you know, um, how they want to present themselves. They have disposable income and they're spending it more than ever on teeth training. And I think it's been great for, for, for Embrace. And, oh, I love hearing that. Especially, you know, with plastic aligners, again, you know, people think it's all the craze, but the fact is a lot of people don't want to be reaching into their mouths every single day. It's hidden. And the other part you can't, you can't underestimate is it because it doesn't require effort. Right. Uh, right. Uh, um, I mean, wearing something, these, these plastic aligners, you're going to wear them 22 hours a day for years on end for it to work. Right. Yeah. And there's some educating in the market that, you know, we need to do. And I think, you know, we've been brainwashed to think that that's the answer, but you know, most people quit, aligner therapy because they just burn out. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And, and, and they settle for a substandard 
results. And that's why the market's underpenetrated. I mean, most people don't realize that out of the 184 million people who can afford orthotic treatment, who need orthotic treatment, there's only 5 million people getting started in the U.S. each year. Wow. So think about that delta, right? Yeah. Now there's, there's, there's 170 something million people that are spending money on other beauty health things, but not on teeth straightening. And that's that incredible. That's the opportunity that we have here. That's an incredible opportunity. So how are you balancing all this? I mean, you've got to be so busy. You're drinking from the fire hose at work, but you also have two beautiful children. How are you balancing your time between work and family and all of it? You know, that's that's a good question, Sean. I mean, how, how do we make time for all these things? I think our listeners, um, I mean, everybody's trying to struggle with these things. And I think that yeah. goes back to, again, being present. You can't do everything. You need to wake up every day. At least now I'm going through the practice of waking up every day, making sure I have the two or three most important things I need to do. Everything yeah. else is noise. Everything else is noise. That's right. an important way of thinking about it, just stay laser focused. And so how are you spending your free time when you've got some downtime? Um, I, I mean, you know, I have a six-year-old and a, and a three-year-old and uh, as much as I can, I love to spend time with them. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Gabe Goldberg, uh, <laughs> Gabe, Gabe and I were talking the other day and he's like, you know, do you miss those simpler days? And I kind of said, you know, in a way I do, but in a way I don't, because life is still simple if we keep it simple. Yeah. And kids keep you young and they keep you engaged and I can imagine that um, your meditation and all the stuff that you're working on to stay present is uh, making you an even better dad. You know, um, I turned 40 this year. I think every 10 years or so, you do kind of stop and reassess things and reevaluate and reinvent yourself. You know, I think in my 20s, it was a lot about what do I want to do, you know, and in my 30s, it was about proving I can do it. And I think now it's just about just being present and yeah. you're still gunning. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's still in me. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, 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 I'm still out there trying to, you know, do what I do, but, but really being present and enjoying the journey. Well, and yeah, that, just realizing the journey part of it, not the destination. So that makes sense to me. Um, so when you do have free time and you're there, not with your six and eight year old, mm-hmm. Um, what about just a day for you? What would you choose? Would you, are you like outdoorsy? Do you like to sit and have, you know, six hour brunch with your friends and get boozy? Like, what do you like to do? (laughs) (laughs) Um, nowadays I, I'm really enjoying the outdoors, right? You, I'm starting to enjoy all the free stuff that you've always had around you. I mean, I live, I live in Huntington beach. The beach is like literally a couple of blocks away from my house and I'm, and, and I never go there. So um, really, I'm, I'm trying to enjoy all the f- things that God, the world had always given us. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and going back to that 20 year old me when I lost everything and that was the best thing that ever happened to me. I, I think, again, you got, you, got, you got to remember that those yeah. are things that matter. I yeah. can't imagine having the beach like that two blocks away. It's so stunning there. And so when you're, when you're like Sunday and have that feeling of like that Sunday night feeling, what do you do to set yourself up? for a good week? Do you have kind of any rituals or yes, do. <laughs> ways that you set yourself up? Yes, I do. Um, three simple things I need to make sure in the first hour of every day. That's uh, gratitude, exercise, and meditation. It just sets up my day and it's free. And gratitude, you're journaling every morning? I do. I do journal now. Oh my gosh. Uh, and, and it's as simple as what are three things that you're grateful for. And like, you have to just sit there and just like feel it, you know? And, you know, it's funny when I started doing it, it was again, like you fall into the old traps, right? It was like, oh, I'm thankful for my house. I'm thankful for my car. I'm thankful for my watch or whatever it is, right? And then now it's just as simple as, I'm grateful for how my son makes me feel when he hugs me in the morning. Oh. And then I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for having an amazing wife that always makes sure I have food when I'm working my butt off, you know, um, and those, those things are free and you, you have, you have, you know, yeah. um, anyway, so three most things that you're most grateful for. And then what's your exercise? And then, and then the next thing after that though, um, is what is one thing that will make today great? Right. Um, and then one affirmation. 
you know, that you have to believe in. It, it, it could be anything. So affirmation is daily. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, you know, come on, let's keep it real. We're all entrepreneurs. There are some days you wake up and you're like, WTF am I doing? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and, and only you can say it to yourself because you, you, you got all these people out there that you, you know, you got to keep, you know, keep a face, keep on. a happy face. Yeah. yeah. So we all been there, right? If you, you don't raise your hand, you're faking the funk. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, sometimes it's as simple as I chose to do this. I can do this. That's this it. is amazing, John. I love this. Um, and, and, and I'll tell you, Shauna, it's real. And this is, it's as simple, like be, you're strong, be strong. That's it. You know, um, yeah. Uh, so I, I think that my my most my most my most powerful one is you chose this, you can do this. You know. Oh, actually, yeah. one of them is one of them. I tell myself is you're playing with house money at this point, which means you're ahead. You know. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, I think I'm I'm digressing here, but this started off as a master's thesis for me in school, right? And when I started off. It's like climbing a mountain, right? You just kept looking up because you're at the base of the mountain. You just kept looking up. You just take one step, one step, one step, one step. The times when I falter is when I look down. Mm, interesting. Because every step forward is the same step. Every decision is, I mean, the decisions are different because you're making billion dollar decisions now and not thousand dollar, you know, decisions. But, but the difficulty of deciding is the same. Yeah, the same magnitude of like relativity. Take the damn step. Yeah, take the damn step. When you hesitate is when you fall, you know. So, so. Um, and so, so, do you feel successful? I'm successful without all these things. Yeah, I would imagine. I would hope that from everything that you're saying, success that you, is a, that you have a, had a moment to at least success recognize it. Success. I mean, you know, again, success is a feeling that's internal. It's not external. Mm -hmm. You have to, if I have to, I'm talking to myself right now. This is my morning affirmation here. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to be a part of it. And let's do it together. And look, I mean, again, don't get me wrong. We're going to change the world. Yeah. Okay? And, and, and doubling the market, doubling the people who gain teeth training, is just a outcome of the internal success where we need to believe it and feel it internally first. Mm -hmm. and, but, you know, at the same time, if if you if you need that external validation to your, yourself be happy or successful, you know, so to speak, you're going to be freaking miserable, and you're going to be the CEO that nobody wants to follow, and you're you're going to wake up one day, look yourself in the mirror, and say, "WTF? Am I doing this?" You know, yes. it's okay to do it once a year, <laughs> twice a year, but if every single day you're doing that, the passion's gone. Yeah. Um, after I I do my my morning meditation, or sorry, morning gratitude. Then it's um, 30 minutes of exercise. And I don't try to, I've, I've done every single type of thing out there, like this, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, trainers and freaking crazy regiments. And it's as simple as I have an Apple watch right now. I got to close my ring, close my ring in the morning. That's it. Right. Whatever it takes to close the ring. Sometimes it's, it's going for a run. Sometimes it's going for a swim. Sometimes it's like yoga, you know, um, I'm going to confess. Fitness Plus has this dance routine, this dance function. <laughs> the other day, I was dancing to Backstreet Boys for 20 minutes. Oh, my gosh. Gabe okay. Goldberg would be so proud. It's okay. I don't care. You know? yeah. It's uh, movement. You just got to move your body. And, and it's about creating that momentum. Just every, I, I do believe in routine keeps things going, right? So 30 minutes of that and then 10 minutes of meditation. And that's where you just sit there. And after you get the endorphins going, Sit there by yourself and enjoy that natural high and have your thoughts to yourself. And then you check your phone. Oh my gosh, that's so disciplined. That's incredible. Not, I, I am so, so big on this here. Do not touch your phone. Everybody here, especially entrepreneurs, the first thing you do is probably pick up your phone, right? I've been trying, John, for this for a long time. It's almost, it's like an addiction, weird you, it, Impulse. It's, addiction. it's the other 24th century cigarette. Yes, it's addiction. terrible. There's been billions of dollars spent on making this a drug. Okay. Yes. So, so um, there's this quote that, that, that I believe in is that you want to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. And when the first thing you do is check your phone, 
you are a thermometer. You're responding to the environment. But if you keep that first hour to yourself, and I'm, I'm learning how to do this, you, you start controlling your day. You're a thermostat. Mm, I love this. I have so many little nuggets I'm getting from you. I wish I could sit next to you all day and just have the, the wisdom. You're dropping knowledge, John. I love oh, it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, to be honest, this, this, this is other thing that I'd love to, I, I mean, you know, listeners out there, I found successful people, find successful people to learn from. And I'm really big on mentors, right? So, um, you know, I think everybody should have, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this, everybody should have uh, a mentor that you learn from, a friend that you learn with, and, you know, a person that you can, you know, teach that can learn from you. And I think those three things. Wow. I love it. So my, my final question for you, John, is what fuels you? What's your ultimate fuel? We talked a lot here about meditation, which is really, in a sense, identity, you know, knowing, knowing yourself. And that question's, you know, so insightful because I, I meet a lot of people. Yes, you, you do too. And a lot of us start with a why and we forget why we're climbing the mountain. We do. My why has evolved and changed. This is the truth. You know, um, it started off as, you know, making sure this invention goes out there and, you know, um, um, can make impact. And then as you grow a team, it starts becoming about them, you know, making sure that they reach their aspirations and goals in life and, you know, all those things. And of course, you bring investors in, you want to make sure that you get a ROI for their, you know, um, investment and, you know, yada, yada. I mean, I am getting to the point in my life now where, you know, I do have some people that I mentor and I want to show people that you can, you know, you can um, write your own script, you know, um, not be put into someone else's box, right? Um, so my, you know, my very sort of tangible KPI is, yes, I want to double the market, you know, but the intangibles is really what fuels people. And um, my, in, my intangibles right now, if anything, is um, other than impacting all the people's lives that we're going to impact as we grow the market and all those things is, you know, it really is important to me that you know, no matter where I end up in this mountain, and I don't know how high it is, that I want truly everybody listening, um, everybody out there that has been told how life should be or who they should be and what, you know, how they should behave and all those things, just to know that don't climb someone else's mountain, climb your own mountain. And wherever you end up, you end up, put a stake in the ground and be proud of it.